Have you had trouble with your computer before? Um, did you know what was going wrong with it? Or have you learned in this class how you can better secure your computer and how you can keep your computer up and running all the time? We're going to talk about some of those things today in this uh, version of AP Daily Live. My name is Mrs. Julia Lano, and I teach at Hamilton Southeastern High School in Fishers, Indiana, and we will be covering topics in AP Computer Science Principles today. So what is on the agenda? What will we learn today? In this video, we'll review the topics of digital divide, crowdsourcing, legal and ethical concerns, safe computing, including encryption. So some topics that you should have covered um, in your classes, just some a lot of review in today's lesson of these topics and making sure you understand the types of questions that will be asked on these topics. So here are the specific topics in a little more detail. First one, digital divide. It describes the issues that contribute to the digital divide. So we'll need to be able to do that. So what's the digital divide? Right, whether um, people have the internet or if they don't have the internet or they even have a device. So there's a lot of varying um, things now with um, the internet. It's not just about the device, it's about how fast your internet is too. Crowdsourcing, another great topic. You should be able to explain how people participate in problem solving process at scale. So crowdsourcing, another great topic. Legal and ethical concerns. Explain how the use of computing can raise legal and ethical concerns. We'll be taking a look at that topic today as well. Safe computing, this is the big one and you may have experienced some of this. Describe the risks to privacy from collecting and storing personal data on a computer system. Explain how computing resources can be protected and can be misused. And explain how unauthorized access to computing resources is gained. So we'll be talking about those and looking at questions over that. The skills covered in today's uh, video are, you need to be able to explain how collaboration affects development of a solution. Describe the impact of a computing innovation. Describe the impact of gathering data and evaluate the use of computing based on legal and ethical factors. So our agenda for today is we're first gonna go over, so those were the um, topics and skills. We're gonna review some more important terms first. Then we'll look at some example problems before you'll have a chance to answer some multiple choice questions on your own. And don't forget, we'll have that Create PT tip of the day. Hopefully you're about to wrap up your Create PT. Um, it's due soon. So um, we'll give you a couple tips as you wrap up that project to submit to the College Board. First up, we'll do some review. So lots of terminology with these topics. So we'll have quite a few things on the slides here, but we'll talk about each one and make sure that you have these down pat. So first up, some important essential knowledge. Here's our exact definition of digital divide from the College Board. The digital divide refers to differing access to computing devices and the internet based on socioeconomic, geographic, or demographic characteristics. And this has been in the news a lot lately, an important topic and an important topic in today's society. Next up, we have citizen science. Citizen science is scientific research conducted in whole or part by distributed individuals, many of whom may not be scientists, who contribute relevant, relevant data to research using their own computing devices. Citizen science is huge right now. We all have devices. We all carry a device in our pocket even. So we can use those to collect data that scientists can use. So um, especially when we're looking at um, natural resources and the environment, you can use your phone to collect data that then can be analyzed by scientists to track weather patterns or track migration of animals. So huge th deal right now. You can even go find projects you could contribute to right now. And crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is the practice of obtaining input or information from a large number of people via the internet. Um, one of the biggest crowdsourcing, there's a ton of crowdsourcing apps out there. You may have known, known some um, to help you uh, find lower prices on things, but crowdsourcing, where we have a ton of people that contribute, we can accomplish things real quick and you can have a lot of data that you can analyze to make decisions. 
some more essential knowledge. Um, ease of access and distribution of digitized information raises intellectual property concerns regarding ownership, value, and use. So while we all have access to the internet, or most of us do, there is a problem with ownership, value, and use. When you use something from the internet, you may need to make sure you're citing your sources and that you're not using it in an illegal manner. Computing can play a role in social and political issues, which in turn often raises legal and ethical concerns. So again, all the computing devices and all the things we're able to do with computers can lead to other concerns that we need to be aware of as citizens. Some more important essential knowledge. Personally identifiable information, PII, is information about an individual that identifies, links, relates, or describes them. So it's important that you are not releasing a ton of personally identifiable information online. So while we all have a ton of uh, probably are using our phone for various apps and various social media. It's important that you track where you have released your personally identifiable information and exactly what is that. Everything from your birth date to um, obviously your social security number, but also even your zip code. And our next item, technology enables the collection, use, and exploitation of information about, by, and for individuals, groups, and institution. institutions. So again, so many things that we can do because we're collecting information and so many organizations are collecting information from your location on your phone to you entering information into a website. So it's important that we are aware of all the things that are happening with the information, especially our personally identifiable information. Personal data such as geolocation, cookies, and browsing history can be aggregated to create knowledge about an individual. So while you may only share certain information in certain places, it can be put together using certain technological um, you know, keys to match you up to then know about your location when you browse something and kind of can make a whole history of what you've been doing. So it's important to realize that even if you do it at separate times, it can be aggregated together to create, you know, more information about you than you think you're sharing. And we have some more. We're still, there's a lot, like I said, there's a lot of topics today, a lot of terms we got to know here and a lot of information. So another important essential knowledge statement is information placed online can be used in ways that were not intended and that may have a harmful impact. For example, an email message may be forwarded, tweets can be retweeted, and social media posts can be viewed by potential employers. So it is very important that you are very mindful of everything that you put online and knowing that it can be accessed by anyone, including someone like your potential employer in the future when you're trying to get a job. Important to think about. And then as you are logging into these sites and are trying to protect your data, one way to do that is multi-factor multi authentication. That is a method of computer access control in which a user is only granted access after successfully presenting several separate pieces of evidence to an authentication mechanism, typically in at least two of the following categories, knowledge, so something that the user knows, possession, something they have, and adherence, something they are. So most times, multi-factor authentication involves you entering your password and then likely sending a code to um, your phone so that it is something else you have in your possession that can authenticate who you are. Most times that's what it is, but there are other pieces you see there. You can also just have a second piece of knowledge, so your password plus a security question. So anytime you're doing more than one thing, that's multi factor factor authentication. And next up, we're going to talk about encryption. Encryption is the process of encoding data to prevent unauthorized access. Decryption is the process of decoding the data. Two common encryption approaches are symmetric key encryption involves one key for both encryption and decryption. 
So a common example of symmetric key encryption is um, like a Caesar cipher. So if you take the letters of the alphabet and you shift them three places, then we know that we shift them back three places, we will have the message back. So encryption is the process of creating encoding and then to decrypt it is to take it back to the original message. And that a symmetric key, meaning we use the same key. Once you know how it was encrypted, you can decrypt it. And so that encryption is not used much because that wouldn't work well. And so public key encryption pairs a public key for encrypting the message and a private key for decrypting. The sender does not need the receiver's private key to encrypt a message, but the receiver's private key is required to decrypt the message. So it's a little tricky, but this is how encryption works on the internet today, is that we use this public key, and there's a lot of math that goes on for the use, for me as the, pri or, you know, the receiver, my private key, to be able to unlock and decrypt that message. But no, that way we can send things over the internet. If I was trying to um, encrypt something over the internet and I said, oh, well, I'm going to do this Caesar cipher, everybody would know how I encrypted it. So we have to use this private key so that I don't have to tell everyone how I'm encrypting my stuff. There's a private key and I am able to encrypt it and nobody has to know how I decrypt. So that's how, what's used today. Um, and it's just, you need to know basic knowledge of these two encryption um, techniques. All right, we're almost done with all this uh, information. There's a ton of uh, information on these topics though. So here's more. Certificate authorities issue digital certificates that validate the ownership of encryption keys used in secure communications and are based on a trust model. You may have seen this that a certificate was denied or the security certificate wasn't valid. So again, when you're using that encryption key, we need to make sure that that's the correct key and that you aren't trying to use somebody else's and that it isn't some bogus site trying to take your data. So it has to be verified. And so those are digital certificates. Next up, a computer virus is a malicious program that can copy itself and gain access to a computer in an unauthorized way. Computer viruses often attach themselves to legitimate programs and start running independently on a computer. So the virus itself is an actual program on the computer. How you got that virus depends and can happen in various ways but they can be attached to a legitimate program that you downloaded somehow or something that you installed off of a um, third-party device or even a flash drive. So it's important to know that viruses can come from lots of places, but once they're there, it's a malicious program that you know is intended to cause harm on your computer. All right, we got our final slide of essential knowledge, and then we're going to see some examples here. So some other terms you'll need to know, phishing, not, you know, phishing in a lake or pond, phishing with a PH is a technique that attempts to trick a user into providing personal information. That personal information can then be used to access sensitive online resources, such, a bank, such as bank accounts and emails. And even if it's just your email, they can start sending emails to a bunch of people and crash your email so you don't have access to it. So phishing, usually um, it's asking you to enter information and the source is not legitimate, but they tell you they need your bank's account's been hacked and I need your information to verify. So it's important to make sure that um, a lot of times it comes over email or maybe it's a website that pops up, making sure you're verifying where you're at on the internet and where emails come from. Key logging is the use of a program to record every keystroke made by a computer user in order to gain fraudulent access to passwords and other confidential information. So this can happen on public computers. So if you know you're using a computer that's in a public space, then there someone could have installed a program that keeps track of all the key, keys pressed, then they could come back and pull that data and they could have access to your passwords or anything else you've typed in. A rogue access point is a wireless access point that gives unauthorized access to secure networks. So again, these are all 
things that we are know and are aware of that can um, cause um, security issues with devices and with your information and and with things on the internet. So important terminology that you need to know. And next up, we're going to look at some examples of questions involving this terminology that we've taken a look at. So we'll see a couple example questions before you have a chance to try some on your own. First up, a user purchased a new smart device with embedded software and connected the device to a home network. The user then registered the device with the manufacturer, setting up an account using a personal email and password. Which of the following explains how a phishing attack could occur against the user of the smart home device? Again, a new smart device. Um, so kind of crazy. Yep, I have a uh, Wi-Fi crockpot. So it is a smart device. Um, I actually may need to turn my crock pot down to warm here in a moment. Um, but exact, exactly, it's on my home network and I can control it from my cell phone. So therefore, I've registered it, right? I've, I've set up that device. Um, but now we're talking about phishing. So which of the following explains how a phishing attack could occur against the user of the smart home device? So again, me as the user, I had to set it up. So it's not really an issue with my crockpot at home right now. It's more of an issue with the account I created in order when I registered the device to make sure I had it all set up and running. So let's look at the ans answer options here. A vulnerability in the device's software is exploited to gain unauthorized access to other devices on the user's home network. A vulnerability in the device's software is exploited to install software that reveals the user's password to an unauthorized individual. The user is sent an email appearing to be from the manufacturer, asking the user to confirm the account password by clicking on a link in the email and entering the password on the resulting page. The user's account is sent an overwhelming number of messages in an attempt to disrupt service on the user's home network. So again, remember that our question is focusing on a phishing attack. And so this is pretty easy when you know your terminology because phishing usually happens either from a pop-up or an email or something that you're receiving via text in some way that you click on a link. And so the only answer that involves that is C. The user was sent an email message. So again, once they created that account and have that relationship with the manufacturer, um, hackers can sometimes get in and see that information and then try to send you bogus information to get access to your accounts. That is why you should have different passwords for different accounts. Just another little tip. All right, next question. Which of the following school policies is most likely to have a positive impact on the digital divide? Again, the digital divide is access to devices and the internet. And again, socioeconomic um, standards or other things may be involved in how and why people don't have access to devices or the internet. So here are the answer choices. A school allows students to bring a graphing calculator from home to complete in-class mathematics assignments. A school allows students to bring a tablet computer to class every day to participate in graded quizzes. A school provides a laptop or tablet computer to all students enrolled at the school. A school recommends that all students purchase a computer with as much processing speed as possible so that projects run faster. So again, we're talking about trying to make sure everyone has access, because just like you watching this video right now, it's important that everyone has access to information so that everyone can be productive in society and understand what's going on in our world. And so in this case, it sounds great that the school allows students to bring things, but then what if the student doesn't have something to bring? And then the last answer D is really strong that you get a really fast computer. Most computers are pretty fast today. You don't have to have this super fast gaming computer to make sure your projects run. So this one is pretty simple again, I think, in that you should notice that allowing some people to bring is a problem because not everybody has an item to bring of their own. So 
The answer here, the one that has the most positive impact on the digital divide is C again. A school provides a laptop or tablet computer to all students enrolled at the school. All right, it is time for some practice. So on these next questions we're going to do, I got a little pause symbol. So if you want, I would pause your video, um, take a look at the question and see if you come up with the answer before I reveal it. So again, feel free to pause as we take a look at these next practice questions. Practice question one. Which of the following best exemplifies the use of multi-factor authentication? So remember, we saw that earlier. So here are your answer choices. A computing device enables users to input information using multiple interfaces, including a keyboard, a mouse, and a touchpad. A website requires a user to enter a password as well as a numeric code received via text message before the user can log into an account. Next option, a user employs a public key encryption method that uses one key to encrypt information and a different key to decrypt information. And our final answer option, multiple users share an account to a web-based software program, and each user has an individual username and password. So let's think about the keywords here, multi-factor authentication. And it's a little tricky. They throw out some things that we talked about earlier as well, like public key encryption. But remember, encryption is its own thing. Authentication is different. Authentication is authenticating you to a site. So obviously, this usually has to do with a password. So we got two answers there, B and D, that involve a password. Notice that multi-factor, right? So answer D, they talk about multiple users. A little confusing, but multi-factor authentication or multiple factors or multiple ways that you can identify yourself. So um, we've eliminated A and C pretty much because we know that authentication means we need to authenticate usually with a password and we have two options with passwords. And then those two options, we've eliminated multiple users and multi-factor means more than one way to log into an account. So you should be able to determine that the answer is B. All right, next practice question. A mobile application is used to display local traffic conditions. Which of the following features of the application best exemplifies the use of crowdsourcing? Again, we're going to see a ton of terms in these um, questions. If you can remember your terms and remember the basic ideas behind them, you should be able to do these questions well. So here are our answer options for the best, um, app, be which feature of the application best exemplifies crowdsourcing. Users can save an address to be used at a later time. Users can turn on alerts to be notified about traffic accidents. Users can use the application to avoid heavily congested areas. Users can submit updates on local traffic conditions in real time. So this question can be a little tricky. I think hopefully most of you saving that first answer option, users can save. So we're talking about crowdsourcing and bringing in lots of things. That first question is just to say you saving something on an application. So we should be able to eliminate A rather quickly. B, C, and D all kind of relate to traffic and how you can use the application to avoid traffic. So, but which one of them is talking about crowdsourcing? Remember, crowdsourcing is having a lot of people contribute to solve the problem. So, we can turn on alerts to be notified about traffic accidents, but that's me individually turning on the alert in the application. I'm not really you know, contributing or, you know, that data could be coming from, um, you know, the traffic agency releasing data. So I don't think B is going to be the option. Answer C, users can use the application to avoid heavily congested areas. Again, me as the user, I get on the app, I see it's a heavily congested area. Yep, I avoid it. So again, that doesn't involve others. So the last answer here is users can submit updates. That's where all users can contribute. You are crowdsourcing that all users are putting their part in. And that is the one that is the best exemplifies crowdsourcing.
So hopefully that helps understand that terminology there. Again, the first one you should have eliminated rather quickly. B and C, a little tricky because they kind of talk about, oh, let's use it to traffic, right? Crowdsourcing, help us figure out where the traffic is. But we want to make sure that we understand crowdsourcing is really how you're submitting and we're using all those people. All right, practice question number three. Which of the following activities is most likely to be a successful, uh, be successful as a citizen science project? So here are options. Designing and building a robot to help with tasks in a medical laboratory. Sorting scientific records and removing duplicate entries in a database with a large number of entries. Collecting pictures of plants from around the world that can be analyzed to look for regional differences in plant growth. Using a simulation to predict the impact of a construction project on local animal populations. So let's take back to our um, definition of what citizen science is. And remember that it was the word distributed was in there, or distribute to multiple places. So while citizen science is something that we would something that we would want to help in science, um, it's not just that it helps science, it does it in a certain way. So the first one where we talking about building a robot, it's really awesome, but it doesn't really involve distributed or other people helping with it. The second one, sorting scientific records and removing duplicates. Again, great project, but it really just uses a computer to do that. Doesn't really use citizens to help in that scientific, uh, those scientific records. Um, answer C, collecting pictures of plants from around the world that can be analyzed to look for regional differences in plant growth. Again, if we collect pictures from all over the world, we kind of need people from all over the world. And it's really easy for us to collect pictures with phones now. So that one seems to be pretty good. Answer D, using a simulation to predict the impact. Um, so again, that's a simulation. So again, you're just using a computer to simulate something. You're not really pulling in actual data. So that one doesn't really involve people being involved or distributing to other places. So that is not really a good option either. So the answer here is C, using citizen scientists all over the world to collect those pictures so then they can analyze regional differences in plant growth. Moving on, question number four. A user unintentionally installs key logging software on a computer. Which of the following is an example of how the key logging software can be used by an unauthorized individual to gain access to computing resources? The software records all user input on the computer. The recorded information is transmitted to an unauthorized individual who analyzes it to determine the user's login passwords. The software gives an unauthorized individual remote access to the computer, allowing the individual to search the computer for personal information. The software installs a virus on the computer and prompts the user to make a payment to the unauthorized individual to remove the virus. The software prompts the user to enter personal information to verify the user's identity. The personal information is recorded and transmitted to an unauthorized individual. Again, we go back to the definition here. So what is key logging software? Has to do with the keys on the keyboard and um, recording that information. So, and recording user input, that's important. So we user input, key logging is the important part that we wanna think about here. These are all not good things. Key logging is not something you want to have happen to you because obviously someone's trying to gain access to something. Um, so these other things are all things that can happen. Um, unauthorized individual remote access, that can happen. That's something that hackers are doing right now. Um, they say they're going to help you fix it and they're actually not. Um, a virus, we know those aren't good. And then the last one, um, a software prompts you for personal information. And again, uh, if it's not software you're aware of, then that's not good. But here we're talking about key logging, which is user input. So that kind of software, yep, keeps track of all that. And then someone else could have that software then transmit it so they can access and determine your password. So the answer here is A. On to question five. Which of the following actions is most likely to raise legal or ethical concerns? 
An analyst writes a program that scans through a database of open access scientific journals and creates a document with links to articles written on a particular topic. A musician creates a song using samples of copyrighted work and then uses a Creative Commons license to publish the song. A computer scientist adds several features to an open source software program that was designed by another individual. A public interest group alerts people to a scam that involves charging them for a program that is available for free under a Creative Commons license. Lots of words here, lots to think about on this question. So again, we're talking about raising a legal or ethical concern. So remember the question here, raises a legal or ethical concern. That's our focus here. So the first question talks about someone that writes a program that um, scans through an open access journal, meaning that it's openly accessible to anyone, um, and then creates a document with links to articles written on it. Doesn't seem to be any issue there. Now the topic, right, that's different, but no legal or ethical concerns about accessing data through an open access. Um, a musician creates a song using samples of a copyrighted work, and then publishes it themselves using Creative Commons. That doesn't sound good. Let's look at the other two options. Let's think about those. Computer scientists add several features to an open source software program. Open source is like open access. It is open to all people to use. So that's the idea is that it's open source. We can all contribute to making it better and add features. So that's a good one. Answer and the answer D, a public interest group alerts people to a scam. Again, this seems like a good thing while um, it is someone trying to charge for a program that is free, it isn't a legal or ethical concern as we are just alerting them to the scam. So you wanna focus on the main part of that answer. So again, someone using samples of a copyrighted work, that is a legal concern there. So our answer to this one is going to be B. A couple more practice questions to go. Again, you may pause any time if you don't want to hear the answer so soon. Which of the following is least, again, all caps, least likely to be a contributing factor to the digital divide? We talked about it a couple of times, we saw an example question. So remember digital divide, access to devices and the internet. Some parents prefer to limit the amount of time their children spend using computer devices or the internet. Some individuals in groups are economically disadvantaged and cannot afford computing devices or internet connectivity. Some individuals and groups do not have the necessary experience or education to use computing devices or the internet effectively. Some residents in remote regions of the world do not have access to the infrastructure necessary to support reliable internet connectivity. Back to the question, which of the following is least likely to be a contributing factor to the digital divide? Again, digital divide is access to devices in the internet. We're looking for one that is not likely a contributing factor to that. So, if you have devices or the internet, then that's not a case. That's not a case of the digital divide. It's not a, ca a case of when to use them or limiting use is not to do with the digital divide. So our first answer talks about limiting use. The other answer options all have to do with things that seem to play into the digital divide, economical, um, education, and then also, you know, location. Even here in the U.S., there are areas, right, we're talking regions of the world. Here in the U.S., there are areas where the internet um, is not accessible or it's definitely not fast or not very usable at, with the speeds that are needed. So all those things based on location, background, socioeconomic status, those are all things that contribute to the digital divide. So here, the least likely contributing factor is A, when parents or someone else limits the amount of time you use it, that isn't the digital, that doesn't contribute to the digital divide. 
One more practice question before we touch on the Create PT tip of the day. This one's a long one. I know. Um, we'll talk about the specific parts here and you know, look for the bulleted list there. Um, we're talking about an app, StreamPal. StreamPal is an audio streaming application for mobile devices that allows users to listen to streaming music and connect with other users who have similar taste in music. After downloading the application, each user creates a username, personal profile, and contact list of friends who also use the application. The application uses the device's GPS unit to track a user's location. Each time a user listens to a song, the user can give it a rating from zero to five stars. The user can access the following features for each song that the user has rated. A list of users on the contact list who have given the song the same rating with links to those users' profiles. A map showing all other users in the area who have given the song the same rating with links to those users' profiles. A basic StreamPal account is free, but it displays advertisements that are based on data collected by the application. For example, if a user listens to a particular artist, the application may display an advertisement for concert tickets the next time the artist comes to the user's city. Users have the ability to pay a monthly fee for, the, for a premium account, which removes advertisements from the application. All right, there's a lot of information there. We're only gonna focus on some of that. Which of the following statements is most likely true about the differences between the basic version and the premium version of StreamPal? So let's focus on the differences there. So one's free, one's paid, and thinking about what that changes. So answer A, users of the basic version of StreamPal are more likely to give songs higher ratings than are users of the premium version of StreamPal. Well, that could be because they're not paying for it. So oh, these, all these songs are great, but that doesn't really, uh, you know, that's just kind of a, it's not really a direct um, trueness there. It's just kind of a thought. Um, B, users of the basic version of StreamPal spend more on monthly fees than do users of the premium version of StreamPal. Does it seem to be correct? Although they could pay little fees, it didn't say anything about that in the question. So I don't think that one's the one we want. Users of the basic version of StreamPal use less data storage space on their devices than do users of the premium version of StreamPal. This is talking about storage space on their device. Uh, that doesn't have anything, again, the music is being streamed, so that doesn't take up storage space on the device. So I don't think that's going to be our answer either, so we're hoping D makes sense. Users of the basic version of StreamPal indirectly support StreamPal by allowing themselves to receive advertisements. So while it is free, it's not really free. They are using you to do advertisements, which is how they make money, is by selling those ads and they base it off your ratings. So then that's targeted advertising, which was what a lot of um, companies are looking for these days. So that is our answer, answer D. All right, time for the Create PT tip of the day. Make sure that your procedure includes an algorithm with sequencing, selection, and iteration. Yes, the algorithm needs to be in your procedure that you screenshot for your written responses to earn the point for both row four and row five on the rubric. If you're not sure or you're confused between the rubric and the directions, when in doubt, check the directions. Again, your teacher should have provided those to you and those are available on the College Board website, that student handout, make sure you double check those. They're also available on the digital portfolio where you submit. So just make sure you review those directions before you final submit, which you should be doing very soon. And as you see on the screen there, there's a link to more PT instructions, rubrics, and videos on that um, tiny URL. So check that out if you're still needing some help finishing up. And so what should we take away from this AP Daily Live for AP Computer Science Principles? 
Remember these terms and the information around these topics, digital divide, crowdsourcing, legal and ethical concerns, and safe computing. We covered a ton of topics there. There's a ton of topics that you need to know. When it's time for the test, if you forget something or you feel like you're not sure about it, remember to use terminology in the answers to try to eliminate choices and pick the best one related to the question. If you want to review any of these topics further, remember to check out AP Classroom for the AP Daily videos on any of the above topics. They all have videos that are only six to eight minutes in length covering those topics. And tomorrow, join Sandy Chaika for Programming Fundamentals and Algorithms. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you in two days.